back when the official Arch Installer was first released, I was incredibly critical of it. Not because I think that everybody should do a manual Arch installation or anything like that, but because it was bad. It was really buggy, you entered in the wrong letter, and the application would crash. It was in a state where it should never have been shipped with the ISO. But since then, the devs reworked the application, I don't know how many times at this point, a bunch of times, and it's gotten better every single time. And now we are presented with this. And it's not perfect. You'll see there are some issues here and there, but it is almost ready. This new UI was added in the most random update you can think of, 2.4.1. Who does a major rewrite in 2.4.1? Apparently the dev of Arch install does. But the first thing we notice is it's going from a sequential list, we don't really have any control over what things you set and what order you set them in, to a more typical Arch installer where you can go in basically any order you want. And unlike a lot of the Arch installers out there, it doesn't make any modifications until you run the install command. So if you want to go and modify your petition table, you want to go and choose different kernels, you want to go and add accounts, delete accounts, none of that stuff is changed until the end. The first thing you notice is there's a lot of options which are default set, sort of things that are really just uncontroversial. Things like using swap, things like having a host name automatically set, having a kernel automatically selected being the default Linux kernel, having NTP on, things that you're probably not going to change, but if you want to, they can be modified. There are some default values missing that you might expect to be set. One of those being select audio, that is for selecting your audio server, pipe wire or pulse audio. The reason why that's not set by default is this can be used to install Arch on a server. The other thing that you might expect to be set is configure network. By default it's set up to use nothing, but this can be set to copy the configuration from the ISO, use network manager, or do a manual configuration. I think the only reason why this isn't set is because all of these have sort of their own use cases where you might want them. While a lot of people will use Network Manager, if you don't use Wi-Fi, having Network Manager there isn't really that much of a requirement. But most importantly, this has the single best feature of any single Arch install and everybody should just copy this. If we go to install, it says two configs missing. It tells us what we need to set to make sure it's working. There are so many installers in there where you can go from setting literally nothing, having no petition table set up or anything like that, click on the install button literally at the start and not have a working installation. This won't let you do that. It's by no means a revolutionary feature that nobody has ever done, but having these features here that stop people from being stupid and stop people from giving themselves a really bad experience is going to be a good thing. So let's just go up to the start and work our way through the installer. First thing here is the Arch install language. This is the language the installer is actually going to be in. I can't tell you if any of these translations are good, but what I can tell you is the formatting is based around English. So as you can see, all of the sets here are in a line. Let's put it on French. Yup, we can clearly see that's not working properly. French is clearly a more verbose language than English is, so I don't really know how you'd go about fixing this because having the, uh, the line all the way over where it is with this line here, it would look really strange with some of the lines that are really, really short. So maybe put the setting on another line or maybe put the setting at the start. Actually, setting at the start might work, but then you'd have different problems because of that. I don't know what you could do. But I'm going to put it back on English because I cannot read French. So right now there is a Dutch, French, German, Spanish, and Swedish translation. I expect that other languages will be added as other people who know those languages support the project. You'll notice that some of the options are a single option, like say with the keyboard layout here, and some of them are a set of square brackets. So anything that is a single option, this is going to be something where you just set a single option. So in my case, I'm using a US keyboard, so that's perfectly fine. But for something like mirror region, you might want to have mirrors from various different regions. So in this case, when we go into that, it's going to have checkboxes next to things you want to select. So in this case, I'm going to say Australia, but let's say I also wanted the, um, I don't know, let's say I wanted the Denmark mirrors as well. If we now go and press enter, both of those are going to be set. But there's some strange interactions you'll notice in the list. So at the top it says, use escape to skip. Now what you might think is, escape is going to take us back to the main menu, but keep whatever values we had set there before. 
What it actually does though, is resets the value. It doesn't matter how much you have set, I could have, you know, 10 or 20 different things selected in here. If we then go and press enter, if we then go back into it and press escape, it is always going to reset it to the default value. Now, I think this is a strange interaction, but there's no other way to reset any of the settings, not like a global reset or anything like that. So as a stopgap solution, I don't think it's a bad idea. What I do think is a bad idea though, is the way that enter works. So when I wanna go out of this list after I've selected everything, I press enter. So Australia and Austria, press enter, those things are selected. But what if I go into this list and press enter on something I don't currently have selected, like say Cambodia? It will actually go and add that into the list rather than going with the list I'd already selected. It seems like one of the shortcuts that makes sense for selecting a single option. Say, for example, I just want to select Australia. Rather than pressing the spacebar to select it, I can just press enter and it will go and select that for us. But for anything longer than that, it is going to lead to some undesired results. Next up, we have the hard drive selection, which needs a bit of work. Right now, it is just dumping out the value from Python. I can see there is dev SDA, I can see the size of the hard drive, I can see the free space, but I would like this to be formatted in a better way rather than just running print on the object. Anyway, I'm just going to press enter on the dev SDA device, and then it takes us back to the main screen, moving us to the next option. And you might notice there's a couple of new options on the screen. Disk layout and encryption passwords. So in some cases, there's going to be options hidden until you've done the previous thing required to actually set that. Now, the way that disk layout works could be a little bit better. If you just want to have the basic Arch installation where you have a boot petition and you have a root petition, just go to wipe all selected drives and use a best effort default petition layout. Let's say I want to use ext4 as my root, and then it just magically does it for us. It doesn't show us what's being done, but it just gives us that basic layout. But if you want to have a bit more customization, what you want to do instead is go to the first option, select what to do with each individual drive, followed by petition usage. From here, if you select suggest petition layout, it'll do basically the exact same thing we saw before, giving us the option to select our file system, but this time dumping us into this petition tool. I've said it before and I'll say it again, don't make your own petition tool if you don't know what you're doing. This has most of what you need, but there is a pretty obvious thing missing. There's no way to modify any of the existing petitions. So any of these things that have already been made, if you want to modify them, you have to delete it and then make it again. Also, we can do this. Let's make a new petition. Let's say I want it to be, I don't know, it doesn't matter, ext4. Let's say I want it to start here. I want it to start at the end. And hey, look at that. Now I have two petitions that are taking up the exact same space. I have my main one on root and this new one I just made. That just frankly shouldn't have happened, and it shouldn't have let me make a new petition. Now, there are some nice things in here. There are some ButterFS things, so you can go mark a petition as compressed. You can make some sub-volumes, but I still think that if you want to have a custom layout, you probably shouldn't be using Arch install yet. In the future, yes. If all you want to do is have a basic install, though, this is perfectly fine. Let it go and automatically make it. Luckily though, it's really easy to clean this up. Let's go to clear slash delete all petitions. Then let's go to suggest petition layout. Let's go to ext4 and then magically it's back. Now the way we get back to the main menu isn't by selecting any of the options in this list. We go and press escape. So it sort of changes the way that escape works. In some cases it resets the value. In this one it actually saves the value. I don't have any of my drives marked as encrypted, so I don't need an encryption password. Now, for the bootloader, I am using UEFI. If you're on a BIOS system still though, it does support BIOS. It's just going to use Grub instead. In the case of UEFI though, we can go and use Grub if we want to, but it defaults to systemd boot CTL instead. Now for the swap, you might have noticed there wasn't a swap petition. So this is going to be using swap on ZRAM, which I don't fully understand, but from what I do understand, it's like a compressed part of your RAM or something like that. I'm just going to leave it enabled. Host name is fine. You can set a value, do whatever you want. I'm just going to call it Arch. That's what I typically call my Arch systems. Now, when it comes to the user accounts, it can get a little bit confusing. There is a set root password and specify super user account. I suggest not touching this unless you're going to have a super user account that is not the root account. 
it is going to implicitly create a root account. So if you go and specify the super user account and then specify the root account, it's actually going to try to create a second root account and it's going to crash the installer. So just don't touch this option. You probably don't need it. If you want to go and make another super user, you can do it through specify user account. This option just shouldn't even be here. So I'm going to set the root password. I'm going to use my very powerful password I always use. And because the password is so weak, it tells me it's a weak password. It confirms if I want to use it. I'm going to say yes, because I don't really care. It's a VM and I'm going to delete it after this video. You probably also want a user account as well. I'm going to set the username to be Brody. I'm going to set a very strong password. Once again, it's going to say my password is very weak. So I'm going to say, I don't care. I'm going to set the password again. And now we're done. Now, this account is just a regular user account. It's not entirely clear, but we can make this a super user account by pressing enter on it. So this is going to give you the option to promote and demote the user, change its password, or delete the user. In my case, I'm just going to leave it as it is, and then go confirm and exit. A lot of installers out there have this concept of profiles. Basically, a list of extra applications you might want to add to your install. In this case, we have the desktop profile, the minimal profile, the server profile and XORG profile. I'm going to say go to the desktop one. This is going to have a bunch of different desktops listed. So awesome, BSPWM, Budgie, Cinnamon, so on and so forth. These are going to be configured in the way the dev wants them to be configured. They're going to have extra applications besides just this thing. In my case, I've never really been a fan of these. If I want to use one of these, I will go and manually set it up myself. When we go and select one of those options though, it'll give you the option to go and select your GPU drivers. In my case, I'm using VirtualBox and then it goes and sets it. But as I said, I don't really want it. So I'm going to go and clear that out. With the audio here, you might notice a slight problem. The casing on none is different. I think I know why this is happening. So the none that is set for the profile, this is the none type in Python. None is basically the Python equivalent of null. Whereas the none that is set for audio is actually one of the options in the list. So that is none as a string. It's not a massive problem that affects usability. It still installs the same stuff correctly, but it is a kind of weird issue. The kernel selection works basically as you'd expect. It supports the four standard kernels available for Arch. I'm just going to go with the default one though. The next option is the additional packages to install. Now, in previous versions, this used to be a bit buggy. Nowadays though, it's basically fixed all of that. So let's say I want to install Firefox and I want to install NeoVim, but I forget the packages called NeoVim and not NVim. So it's actually going to check if those packages exist and when it finds out that NVim doesn't, it automatically removes it from the list and tells us that it couldn't be found. The original version crashed when it did this. So this is a big improvement. You can argue about whether it should remove it from the list or just tell you that it couldn't be found, but I do like it the way it is. I'm just going to say we don't need anything though and then leave it as it is. Time zone works as you might expect a time zone to work. It defaults to UTC and this list is really, really big. So if we go and press the slash key, this can be done on any of the list interfaces. This will open up a search. So I am in Australia. Now, don't press enter because that will go and select the value. Just start scrolling down and I am in... Did I scroll past it? Yes, I did. Adelaide. There we go. And then in the additional repos option, there is multi-lib and testing. There are other repos that do exist for Arch or other like standard Arch official repos, but this is perfectly fine. I'm going to enable multi-lib because let's say I wanted to do gaming on this system. There is a slight bug here. It actually moves the cursor that would normally be moved to the next line into this gap that has nothing in it. Once again, it's not really that big of a deal. It's just one of those things that can be polished out. Before we go and hit install, we can actually go and save the configuration. So this will let us go and output everything that we've configured. So our user configuration, our user credentials, you can see my very secure password there, and also the disk layout. So I'm going to go save all, and we can go and enter the directory that I want it to be saved in. I'm going to just save it in the root. Now, if we go and quit out of the applications, so by going down to abort here, if we go into that directory, so into root, as we can see, two of the three files are there. I've run this multiple times, and every time the disk file has been missing. I don't know why, but assuming that it was working, if we go and run arch install dash dash config, and then pass in the first file, so user underscore configuration.json, 
dash dash config, then the second file, so that being user credentials, that will go and reload the application, and then load in all of those same settings. Hopefully this one gets fixed, so you can actually go and reload whenever you want. Also notice the mirror region and also the additional repositories weren't set either, so... Right now, saving and loading doesn't work exactly the way it should be, but once everything is set like it should be, if we go to install, that is going to start the installation process. Basically, it's going to go through the settings. You can't see it all on the screen because my VM window is too big, but at the bottom down here, it's going to say press enter to continue, and from there, it's going to go through everything it needs to do. Once it is done, if you select do post installation correction, do not turn your system off yet. So let's go and run LSBLK. Our petitions seem to be made. If you turn your system off here, it will not work because this is the most critical bug this has. It doesn't update our FS tab file until we go and exit out of that. If you reboot before exiting, your FS tab file will be blank and your bootloader won't be able to find the kernel. And that's a big problem. So assuming you've done everything correctly and you don't brick your system, when you reboot the system, you'll be given this screen right here. So it seems like everything is fine if we go into the system and we actually wait for it to boot properly and then log in. I'm going to use my root account. I'm going to set my password. We do a lsblk. We have all of the petitions. We have our swap. It seems like everything's fine. There will always be a push for more features in the installer, more things to tweak, maybe even adding a GUI to the installer, which I don't think anybody is actually considering doing. But I think in the state that it's in, with a little bit more polish, sort of knocking out some of those critical bugs, I think the Arch installer is going to be basically perfect. And then in a couple of years after time has passed, people can just forget about the fact that Arch didn't have an installer for a while and stop pretending like you have to do a manual installation. But let me know what you guys think in the comment section down below. What do you think about the new Arch installer? Are you going to use it? I would love to know. So if you like this video, I'm going to go and like the video. And if you really like the video and you want to become one of these amazing people over here, go check out my Patreon, subscribe, subscribe, barrel pay, linked in the description down below. I've got a podcast called Tech Over Tea available basically anywhere. I've got a gaming channel called Brody Robertson Plays. That's it for me and I'm out.